I'm Kathy Johnson from Pyramid of Potential, and this is video 22 out of 60 of the Harnessing Learning Potential video series. Today we're talking about the spinal gallant reflex, which is normally present prenatally until about nine months. Now I was able to take a little baby, a four-week-old baby, and flip him over onto his tummy and tickle his back. And when I tickled next to his spine, not on his spine, but next to his spine, um, on one side he went like that, and on the other side he went like that. And you might be wondering, why does a baby need that reflex? Well, it turns out that when a baby is going through the birth canal, that um, as, his pel as his back hits mom's pelvic bones, he goes like this, and it helps him come through the birth canal. So there is a fairly significant um, correlation between C-section babies and a retained spinal gallant. So you might be wondering, okay, so the babies and they're getting born, they go through this integration, but it's not a full integration if it doesn't get fully integrated until nine months. So you might be wondering, what else could cause a retained spinal gallant? Well, um, this has to do with um, having a ticklish back. So for example, going like this, okay, the baby would go like that, going like that, the baby would go like that. So there's, there's information that's being given through the back. And so how does the baby deal with this? During that first nine months, um, one of the things that they start to do is they're playing on their back, playing with those, those little jungle gyms and they're squirming around. And so they're getting a lot of proprioception, touch and gravity uh, onto their back. And so this also brings up a point about why babies might not integrate primitive reflexes. One of the reasons, there are many, and we cannot tell exactly why, but one of the reasons is because of our culture and what happened Oh, about 30 years ago. Um, see, my babies, they range at this point from uh, 22 to 27. And when they were born, the doctor said, don't put your baby on their tummy or they could get SIDS. Don't put your baby on their backs or they could, get, um, they could spit up and aspirate. And don't put your baby on the floor because there are lots of germs and they could get sick. So. Um, we kept our babies safe, and the manufacturers created all these brand new things, gadgets, that never existed before. Like these front packs, and these back packs, and these swings, and these cool car seats where you put your baby in and you can pop him into the, the car, and he's safe. And when you finish doing your grocery shopping, you can pop him out, bring him into the kitchen, put the baby on the kitchen counter, and get your groceries while the baby's safe. If you have to go take a shower, take that baby in that car seat into your bathroom, take your shower the whole time the baby is safe. And the only time you really have to take them out is to maybe feed them and to change their diapers. So this was the culture back then. And guess what happened? Our babies were much, much safer, okay? The pediatricians told us to do this to improve infant mortality, and it did. However, it came at a price. Our babies didn't spend as much time on the floor, on their tummies, and on their backs. And so, therefore, many babies didn't have a chance to integrate their primitive reflexes. We're seeing a change in culture today. So the pendulum seems to be swinging back, where the pediatricians are now talking about tummy time, and some of the pediatricians are talking about floor time, including tummy and back. So I think we're going to see um, that more children, more babies are integrating their reflexes. Now, back to spinal gallant. Uh, let's talk about what those uh, symptoms are if the spinal gallant is retained. And remember, not that somebody would have all of these, but we're looking for a significant portion, two or three or something like that. We start off with fidgeting. Okay, so this is that ADHD kid who is constantly on the move, okay? Can't sit still, constantly fidgeting. Um, we see the possibility of bedwetting. So I've got a story for you. 
an acquaintance of mine one day said, so Kathy, what is it you do? And I said, blah, 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 that wedding, blah, blah. And she stops me. She says, my 11-year-old has never had a dry night. Um, we have tried everything. There is um, alarms and pills and waking him up and rewards and punishment, even sending him to the psychologist to see if he was stressed out. Nothing, nothing, nothing worked. And so she said she'd give it a try. And it took longer than 30 days, uh, but within 30 days he had his first dry uh, period of time. I think it was a full week. And so he stopped the exercises. But it hadn't, that, that connection, the, the spinal gland had not fully myelinated. And so it came back. So he went and he did uh, several more weeks. So it took like two months, but that was over two years ago. And he never had a wet night since. And by the way, she also said it changed his personality. And when you think about personality, yes, we think we're born with the personality that we have. But if we are constantly frustrated, if we are brighter than we're able to show ourselves to be, this could cause us to feel very negative. And so once many of these things were relieved and his self-esteem improved, guess what? He has a much better, um, happier personality. So let's continue. Next one is poor concentration. And this is that racing mind. The mind where you cannot just concentrate on one thing because all these other thoughts and ideas come in unbidden. And the mind is just constantly going. We might see poor short-term memory. So there was a, um, well, first of all, short-term memory is um, necessary in order to build long-term memory and a good working memory. So it's a very important basis for memory. So there was one student, uh, he'd gone through the entire program, and at the end, the mom said, there's still one thing that's bothering us. You know, my son is nine years old, but still when he sounds out a word on one page, uh, he doesn't remember it to the next page and has to sound it out again. And so, um, and this was constantly happening still. And I said, well, that's short-term memory. Let's go back and reintegrate the spinal gland. And I, and I told her, I want you to call me when the switch flips. Because this is what happens so many times is people are one day like this and then all of a sudden it switches. Two weeks later, she calls. And she said yesterday he was still sounding out you know, every single page. And today it's like he never had a problem. So that's short term memory. And next is auditory processing problems. The ability especially to distinguish between sounds that are similar. So um, that includes the short vowel sounds, a, a, i, a, and a, but it also can include um, sounds like the sounds that come from s, f, sh, and ch. They might all sound like and I mentioned that before. Another thing that it could be is even um, sounds that come from the letters m and n, and there are others. Uh, and there are other things that can happen with auditory processing. We'll be discussing that further um, in the future videos. Also, sensory integration problems. So not just the auditory issues, um, but all of the senses. And um, so this is important just to notice, especially if you're an occupational therapist and you're helping somebody with sensory integration problems. Um, make sure that you integrate the spinal gland while you're giving that sensory diet. And what you should see is that the sensory diet lasts longer and longer and longer. And um, maybe eventually they won't need it. Next is uh, near focusing problems. And this is the ability to um, see clearly uh, near, like for reading. And in most states in the United States, almost all, uh, the, the schools do not test for near point acuity. They are testing for distance acuity. They put a chart on the wall, step the child back 20 feet, cover one eye, say what they see, cover the other eye, say what they see. They're checking to see if they can see the board, but they're not checking to see if they can read a book. And I've had a couple students where they're wearing glasses and the mom has told me that their child was in remedial reading 
until like second grade when somebody said, say, have you had your child's eyes checked? And they're like, no, should I? You see, if it's not required by the pediatricians or by the schools, why would you take your child to find out if they need glasses or not? It just wouldn't occur to you. You would think that the professionals know that that should be checked before trying to teach reading. But so far, I only know of two states, Illinois and Missouri, where the entire state requires uh, seeing an um, optometrist before kindergarten. Uh, next, after that, is um, just basically difficulty with reading, and it's like, yeah, um, how can you deal with reading a word like fish? First of all, if it's blurry and, you know, you can't see the letters, or second of all, if you don't know what sound the F makes, you don't know what sound the I makes, and you don't know what sound the SH makes, suddenly reading is very, very difficult. So spinal lot is one of my favorites, you know, for the reading, for the ADHD. There's so many wonderful things that can happen uh, by just by integrating this. So to learn how to integrate, check out the next slide, and so there are some suggestions on there. Thanks.